Hey there. If you've been enjoying the Unchained Binge podcast, you should know that this podcast, like everything else we do here at the Escape Collective, is member-funded. That means we're funded by, well, you, if you're already a member. And if you're not, we hope you'll think about becoming one. You can head on over to escapecollective.com slash join to sign up and become part of a pretty awesome community. It's a community that supports this podcast and the others on the Escape Collective podcast network, as well as everything that we write about bikes and more over on the escapecollective.com website. It's also a community with a very active Discord channel where we sometimes do live recordings of podcasts, by the way. In other words, there are lots of reasons to sign up. Our monthly memberships start at $11.99 USD, or you can save 30% by signing up annually. We'd love to have you as a member. And again, you can head over to escapecollective.com slash join to find out more and sign up. This is the Unchained Binge Podcast. I'm Kaylee Fretz, and we're going to go deep on Netflix's new Tour de France docuseries, Unchained. Today is episode two, Welcome to Hell. In today's episode, we get a deeper dive into the team of the tour, Yumbo Visma, an at-home visit with Wout van Aert, plus training with Primoz Roglic, and then a glimpse into the tension between van Aert's desire and ability to win and his role working for Jonas Vingago for the yellow jersey. Let's get into it. All right, welcome back, crew. Kit, good to see you again. You too. Johnny Long, you look very reclined. Welcome to hell, Kaylee. <laughs> is this hell is this it maybe we'll find doesn't out seem that bad. Oh, podcasting in purgatory <laughs> doesn't seem that bad doesn't seem that bad and abby mickey how are you hello yeah i'm good <laughs> all right let's get into episode two welcome to hell now the the title of this episode is referring to the hell of the north perry roubaix the cobblestones of northern france that are some of the most difficult terrain that well that any Tour de France can cross and kind of adds a whole nother element to the racing. So in this episode, we, yeah, we get a bit of a, it, it's a Yumbo Visma focused episode. We get a bit on Watt Van Aert, which we get quite a bit on, on Watt Van Aert. We get like a, a tiny training montage with Primoz Roglic. We get this tension in stage five on the cobblestones and we get Pogaccio sequence. And, and some ominous, ominous, ominous music. Because as we mentioned in episode one, his team, UAE Team Emirates, is uh, they're not in this series. They they declined to be part of it. And so Tade Pogaccia, the defending champion at the Tour de France last year, well, he's not really part of it either. He's just sort of on the periphery. So we get a bit of him in this episode as well. Where do we want to start crew the the french title of the whole series in the heart of the peloton so So much much better better. than unchained (laughs) so much better yeah no i i had that in the notes and i forgot to mention in episode one here but it's true yeah uh much significantly better title but also kind of a a slightly more insider title perhaps Oh, uh, Curdy Peloton what? in the heart of the well, oh, yeah. Well, for no other reason than if you if you are truly brand new to the sport of cycling, you don't actually know what a peloton is, right? So <laughs> in France, do you know what a do. chain is though? But that's that's why it works in France because it's a French yeah. word. And I suppose unchained kind of works given the context of this episode. That is very true, actually. But that's the first time I've thought about it, and when it first came up as a title, I was one of the many who obliterated it on Twitter. I'm still not buying it. It fits the mold of all the rest of the same type of series. It doesn't really. It it doesn't. It it just doesn't. Yeah, it does. No. I disagree. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Unchained is not a thing in cycling. Unchained is what happens to animals at the zoo when they escape, not what happens (laughs) in a bike race. Uh, It's also wholly negative. Well... (laughs) Should we get into this episode? Should we get into this episode? Uh, I think we should, because there's there's plenty to talk about. Because this is the episode that introduces us to, frankly, the sort of main protagonist of the entire Tour de France. Right? Uh, spoiler alert: one of the riders on Yellow Visma ends up winning the Tour de France. <laughs> uh, 
if you didn't know that, sorry, but you know it happened a year ago, so I don't, I don't, don't there's any, any real way to avoid that. And so, yeah, this team is is the it's full of of the protagonists. It's also the strongest team in the race. It's got this incredible rider in Wolfgang Ert who can win sprints and time trials and mountains, and is uh, as we see at the end of this episode, pretty key to Vingigo winning in the end because he kind of pulls. Uh, pulls the whole race back together kind of single-handedly at the end of this episode. We get some time at home with him. We're getting a bit more of the kind of backstory here. Did you learn anything about Wild Fun Art in this, uh, in this episode? Or any any insight to be gleaned from those at-home scenes? Uh, my biggest takeaway from that was his son has got exactly the same smile as him. Oh. <laughs> That's basically all I learned. And is, at the time, potty training. And he was eating porridge at night. And his wife was as well. She had like the same meal. <laughs> was that is that just solidar- solidarity from a, the wife of a rider? Just like I will have to, I will eat the same goop that you do. You know, sometimes it's hard to make multiple meals. All right. <laughs> yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, let the parents defend here. Kit, I like how your take your initial takeaway was: oh, his son's got the same smile. Whereas my first thought was, that's an expensive kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, um, it was very clean. The, <laughs> very clean I, the kit mentioned in the last episode that the music when Wout stepped out of the bus in slow motion was very ominous and it was clear throughout this whole episode that he's really getting a villain el- edit like they <laughs> they do not want you to like Wout very much they had this whole I mean manufactured probably like inter-team rivalry which I know is a is a big thing in F1 but is not always a big thing in cycling it has happened in the past but it I think Wout is known for being one of the best domestiques in the Peloton um, while also being able to win and being one of the most selfless riders. Like outside of the Tour de France, we've seen him hand wins to his other teammates like Christophe Laporte all the time. And he's he's really selfless on the bike. So it was really interesting to see this behind the scenes view of Wout, whether it's manufactured or not, as being kind of like the villain against his own team. Yeah, I- I do think that they kind of came around with that by the end of the episode. They kind of, they kind of, they, they built it up, built it up, built it up, built it up, and then it turned out that he was the savior, right? And so they, they did kind of flip it on its head at the end there, just to kind of provide a, a bit of additional context around the, the sort of the way that this, you know, this works within cycling, right? You do occasionally get these kind of intra-team rivalries where you have two riders of very similar type going after the same target. And you can get those kind of rivalries. This is very different because Wout van Aert is never going to win the Tour de France, right? In fact, he says as much in in the episode. The, the, the tension here is not like a Greg LeMond, Bernard no tension where we had two riders both trying to win the Tour on the same team, you know, kind of literally fighting each other on the slopes of these mountains. Uh, this is more Wout van Aert knows that he can win stages and therefore that kind of runs in conflict with always being at his leader's side, which would be Jonas Vingago going for the yellow jersey. So that that's the source of the tension here. And I don't know if they actually explain that particularly well in the episode. Yeah, that dynamic was surprising to me. I got it. And they definitely had picked some, whether they were real or convenient. You know, Vingago maybe was just very tired when they were drinking champagne and he looked moody across the table. Um, and they clearly, I mean, from... We know that some of the shots when Van Aert was coming across the line, having won, and they had the voiceover of him, of that sort of dilemma between stage wins and looking after your leader. And they'd grabbed uh, moments from other stages of Vingegaard kind of falling off his bike. Um, um, so, yeah, that, that that surprised me. I mean, I kind of I, I buy it, I think, the way that they put it together. Um, and, you know, we talked about how Jakobsen comes across well on camera. Um, you know, everyone in this episode also comes across well on camera. Vingo is probably less present, and that's probably for good reason. We're probably going to see much more of him later on. But also, none of them are good enough actors to be able to have that that talking head with Vingo, where he was talking about Van Aert, um, having to, well, knowing that he had to play his team role as well. I don't think he's. I think we'd have been able to tell if that was manufactured, or at least in to quite the extent that it seemed to be shown. I, I think it's also, maybe this is unfair, I think it's also important to remember that Van Aert is Belgian and a Belgian trait is to just sometimes speak very bluntly and not really do the whole more like 
anglophone thing of like not really saying what you mean or like leaving things unsaid um, and you see that when after the stage when Van Art was uh, not being given a talking to but um, one of the managers or sports directors was talking to him while he was getting his massage and saying oh you know maybe things could be different and Van Art's just like hmm and maybe that's because like the, then the resulting conversation got cut a bit um, but that was interesting. It was also with, with Van Aert, it was interesting to see his, the different dynamic when he was at home, just quickly going back to that, when he was much more like sheepish on, on camera, well not sheepish, but just more reserved and aware that he was on camera than just in race mode when he gives the same, the same things. And I, I think that it was nice to have this first insight into a rider outside of the bike race. I think that moment that you're talking about when he's on the massage tail and he's kind of massage table and he's kind of getting a talking to um that to me felt like totally manufactured like he was he was looking like the look on his face was like what (laughs) and the way that the the ds was kind of pitching it sounded very forced so i feel like that was very much for the netflix of it all (laughs) instead of that wow van art like dropped vinigo on a stage that made literally no difference in the general classification and uh, and Wout won in the yellow jersey in a way that like Jumbo Visma would have been able to paper all over their bus for like years to come, you know. I think that that moment was for me like the most over dramatized moment. And they had other moments in the race where they could have built the drama, like the musical bikes moment that we were watching that in real time. Like, what on earth is going on? This is insane. Yep. Why is this is all nuts? And I feel like they didn't do a good job of playing to that scene. I just feel like it was well more chaotic kind of... than I remembered, though. Did Maybe it really? Because they didn't. I felt. I thought it was less chaotic than I remembered. Yeah. Like at the got... time, it lasted for it... an age. Yeah. That's true. We did have it in. Yeah. I just maybe it's just the image of Vingigo on um, Van Hoydonk's bike is just so ridiculous that every time I see it, it's more ridiculous. <laughs> I, I'm gonna push back a little bit on the over dramatization of that stage win for Wout. Uh, like. Mm. Yes, I think that they probably kind of needed to let him do that to, to in order to get out of him. The team needed to let him do that in order to get out of him what they needed later in the race. But at the same time, there's a there's a quick line in there from Pogacar, actually. It's one of the only times, I think it maybe is the only time we've heard him say anything so far. And the line is, it's good you dropped your guys also. I was lucky. And that, and that, so, so the 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 context there is basically Pogacar had 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 fallen off that front group that had Vingigo and Wolfenart in it, right? And there, that was a genuine opportunity for a, a small, not massive, but small GC shakeup. If Wolfenart had taken just a second or two, waited for Vingigo, and then pulled Vingigo up, right? Now, if you do that, there's no guarantee that those two actually make it to the line in front of everybody else, right? No guarantee at all. But at the same time. That was an admission from Pogacar, which, again, w- was clearly not scripted, was definitely, like, not said for Netflix. That was one of those, like, boom mic moments. And we can talk a little bit about what we saw on the ground here, which was basically just, like, an, a- an audio engineer and a and a cameraman running around, um, like, sort of in tandem. And the, the audio engineer has these big boom mics, and they're kind of sticking it into places, hoping to get a bit of audio like that. And they got that bit, and that, that was... That indicated to me that Pogacar had a brief moment in that stage where he was like, oh shit, like there's two teammates up the road. One of them is the guy that is my primary competition in this bike race. The other one is probably the strongest, just like pure Watts strongest rider in this entire race. They could take 20, 30 seconds out of me today. And so I do think that like the drama, that sort of intra-team drama but between Wout Van Aert's needs to win a stage and desires to win a stage and his needs to sort of shuttle Jonas Vinga go around. I think that that, is, that was real early in that race. I do think that the directors probably made the right call in the end to let Wout do his thing and you know get that stage win and remove that pressure. But I, I don't I don't know if it was as overblown as... As it, as it initially appeared. And mostly I, I say that because of that one line from Pogacar. The other thing we saw there was Wout van Aert's celebration at the line where he flaps his, flaps his arms to look like oh, wings. God. And then afterwards, and uh, afterwards in the interviews, it's like, oh, did it give you, does the yellow jersey give you wings or whatever? And at the time we were scathing of this, being like, this is all a Red Bull stun, whatever. But like no one would really say it was. And then 
in 2023, fast forward, when we've just been at the, the Belgian Classics, the first petrol station we walked into, there was a huge cardboard cutout of Wout Van Aert doing the wing celebration with just stacks of Red Bull cans in front of him. And it's, it was the purest vindication I've ever felt. Um, that we were right. It was all a commercial move. Yeah. Which, I, wonder, you know, I wonder how big the bonus was for Wout Van Aert. One, well, taking a stage win, and two, doing that celebration. I, I want to see what his kitchen looks like now, to be honest, after the <laughs> post-celebration. <laughs> so we get this we get this kind of intro at home with Wout Van Aert. We get this slight build of tension in the first half of the episode with stage four and the, the stage win that Wout Van Aert en- ends up taking by dropping his own teammate who's also trying to win the overall bike race that 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 you know that that sort of source of tension in the first half of the episode and then we drop into Primoz Roglic uh or the other section that we get early on is Primoz Roglic uh riding I th- must be in Slovenia he's saying uh yeah. Vala, which is like hello in Slovenian to people on the side of the road we don't get a lot of insight or access into like the home life, or even the training life of Primoz Roglic. He's a very quiet, very sort of protective individual. Did did you gain anything from that segment? I, I certainly did. I loved it. My favorite thing of the entire episode was the music when Roglic's name went across the screen. It was like super ominous. And really, like, very, like, swelled really big, and then cut to Roglic, and he's whistling. Oh yeah, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> just like riding along, like just whistling, and and I loved it. The we subtitle don't... is ominous cello note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then he's just like, I mean, he he then he like says like this is the stupidest thing. This is the most stupid, stupid <laughs> thing. Yeah, it helps to introduce you. My name is Primoz Roglic, and I'm a rider for Jumbo Visma. And it's so funny because, like, yeah, we know nothing. uh, We don't really know much about him. He's, like, such an interesting rider, even to us journalists who've been around the race and have maybe even talked to him, and he's very much still an unknown. And I feel like we got, I don't know, 45 seconds with him in this episode, and I am so much bigger of a fan now than I was before watching this episode. <laughs> I think it would have been really interesting to see this without the Giro, though, because I think it would have been a bigger impact, um, this you know, whistling joker, um, because I think he did come out of his skin or the skin that we had interpreted before. You know, before this year, he was the guy who kind of fell short and then won the Vuelta as a redemption thing. Um, and now he, he's won the Giro and he did it in a particularly... Well, he he just he was a bit more bombastic than we've seen him before, but still, this yeah, I I laughed when he started when he appears on screen and he's just whistling tunelessly, um, and then he's t- telling the guy behind the camera, "This is stupid." Yeah, it's um, like who who would have guessed that Roglic would be the one to sort of break the fourth wall and be like, "Guys, what are we doing here? Like, what is this all for? You know, this three years in development, and now you're making me do the lines to the camera. It's great. It's amazing." You could tell that they like really wanted to include Roglic, but they didn't really know how to fit his storyline in because he's obviously like co-leader before the Roubaix stage with Vinigo. And then like after the Roubaix stage, he he was out of GC contention. So it, it was interesting that they they even built him up as a co-leader because it felt like it was kind of a waste of time. Um, but they need that for... Way, for... But next episode yeah that was gonna be my point is that yeah yeah. it's 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 character development for the glibier glandon stage yeah uh that you know where the where the tour de france ends up ends up being ends up being won and lost right and roglic just plays a huge huge part in that and i think if he just shows up in that it's probably a less powerful episode so i i think that's why we got that 45 seconds the other great roglic moment is when he's out training and then the coach or sports director is like forcing him to drink his liquids or like you've got to drink and then he's just there like so painfully like gulping down whatever's in his bottle it was great it was just such a like screw this yeah i went because he the the ds was then or the coach or whatever was swirling this massive cup few it was like a gallon bottle wasn't it <laughs> and it, I, like i wonder if it was some sort of salted something or yeah, other like that they were then going to test him at the top of the mountain to to see how much salted you use or something like that i don't uh, know like the other thought that i had is the uh, pros these days often spend quite a bit of time essentially training their body to 
uh, take in carbohydrate really efficiently. So, so one of the major nutritional changes in the last sort of 10 years is the riders themselves, they train this, a lot of them do, they can actually, they can use more carbohydrate, they can take in more fuel than they used to be able to because they've trained their bodies to do so. And so if, if Roglic's natural propensity is to go out and do his training rides without enough fuel, he's not training himself to do this in the races when mm-hmm. he actually needs it. And so that may be why, that, this is just a, a theory, that may be why the director was like, Yo, like you have to, you have to have your, you know, hundred grams of carbohydrate per hour or whatever it is, because that's what you're gonna have to do at the Tour de France. And if your gut can't handle it, then it'll be because you didn't train it now. Basically, there's like that- 580 calories per bottle in those <laughs> bottles. <So>. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah, it, it was such a great little petulant moment though, because like especially the GC riders are built up to be these sort of monastic gods who are just so in control and disciplined or whatever. And there's just Roglic at the side of like some B road wherever they are, just being like, "No, I don't want to drink the bowl. <laughs> I've had enough." Speaking of, besides some sort of, I don't know, characterless B road, we got a nice shot of an ibis. Oh yeah, it, oh, yeah. It was the a, establishing shot. It was a classic shot, kind yeah. of inside baseball um, <laughs> moment of this hideous hotel that they were in. Yeah, that's the real. That's the real Tour de France. It's not yeah. all the. It's the glitz. It's not the glitz and the glam. It's the ibises and and whatever. Moving over to Pogaccio, we we did get our first kind of real sequence with him, with you know editing and music and and kind of the whole spiel and and. Uh, an indication of, I think, maybe the way that the whole show is going to be approaching him. What were your takes on that? What were your takes on on Pogacar's first entry? Both that, like, we had that quote really early on from from the Wat Van Aert victory, and then we also had this, like, you know, 10-second montage, basically. Yeah, I had I, I mentioned this in the last episode with re- uh, relation to Van Aert's entrance, his kind of Darth Vader moment coming off the bus. They tried to do similar with Pogacar and he's quite difficult to do because he's so smiley and cheery all the time. Um, but yeah, it was... so. It, it was, And looks uh, like he's 14. Exactly. Yeah, he's a he child. He doesn't look ominous. No, there's no way to make him beard. look ominous, especially when he's got tufts of hair poking out of his head, his head, his helmet. Um, but what was interesting, so we're going to get into the team dynamics in the stage, I'm sure, but what was interesting, and we've mentioned the fact that UAE... Team Emirates aren't involved in the documentary as a whole. But what was interesting and what almost helped the episode was the fact that you had Team Yama Visma, which is very much this powerhouse team, loads and loads of riders. We got mentions for most of them um, throughout the episode. And then there's Pogacar on his own. And that's partly because he was on his own, but it's partly because there's no presence from that team other than the guy who they can't avoid because he's in the white jersey slash the leader of the race. Maybe we also got some insight into how the rest of the peloton or his rivals feel about Pagacha and maybe that's the the ominousness, if that's a word. Like we're all there like watching him like go off the front and be like, Wow, that's incredible, whereas the Peloton are like, oh, this guy. And I get I guess when you don't have access to him it's that it's a good character to, to build him up as because that's kind of your only only real option and you can't have this complex like three D understanding of him because you're just not going to be able to ask him stuff the the difference between like kind of how they edited wow how they edited Broglic and and Pogacar and then you had how they edited Vinigo which was um kind I got cute. the sense yeah I got the sense from this episode that it's going to be kind of hard for them to like make him into this like formidable guy who might win the world's biggest bike race in the future because he's like at one point he says oh it is annoying that Pogacar is so good or something like that and it's and it's just like such a funny thing for someone to say about like their number one rival in the sport is like yeah it's annoying that he's so good. <laughs> like, I think one of my favorite moments of the episode was when Vinger goes sitting, I can't remember if he was cross legged, but cross legged on a bed with Yumba Visma duvet cover. And it just seemed like, you know, it's this little kid sitting in this hotel or sitting at home watching the race. And he's sitting cross legged in his, in his fan kit and he's got the right bedding. And it was just kind of, you know, he's having to do this interview and he's got his little tinted flick of hair. And uh, yeah, it's, it, he's, He's going to, yeah, I totally agree. He is not a formidable character. He's a kind of a sweet guy who, is, you know, he's not, 
it's difficult to mold into anything, I think. We'll see, you wa- I guess. You watch it and you're like, oh man, I wonder if Netflix is just like really bummed that Roglic wasn't their guy <laughs> at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Spoiler, but it's a year ago. Uh, uh, this might be a good time for my my hero's journey film theory mm. thing. Let's hear it. Yeah, let's hear a hero's journey film. Okay, theory. so it, the hero's journey is is anyone who follows film or is interested in film or just narrative structure. It's a pretty standard um, theory, whereby you, you know, you've got your, your your hero, and then something crap happens that puts them on the back foot, and then usually a combination of a superpower, a mentor, and several more hurdles, an enemy. And then there's this obvious kind of road trip journey, whatever it is, to the end goal. And now this is the bit that Abby's going to love. Okay, so I have found a link. I think there's a there's a familiar there's a similarity between Vigigo, Yumba Visma, and the Lord of the Rings. Now, <laughs> yeah, well, see, I told you, I warned you. <laughs> you did. So if Yumba Visma is the Fellowship, um, Vigigo is Frodo. Now I can't quite decide what Roglic is at this point he's either Bilbo Gandalf potentially Gollum and this will become clear in a second because Wout Van Aert is the ring so he's both this powerful Whoa. this powerful object this powerful um, tool weapon um, that is both a an Achilles heel and a superpower for Frodo um, so we've got the uh, <laughs> I feel like an absolute dork right now <laughs> i'm loving it i'm loving every second of it this is like um, the best thing that's ever happened on a escape collective podcast <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah uh, i think i don't know what, what do you what do you think i the idea that um that van art and this purely out of this episode i wouldn't have thought this before the netflix treatment of that team dynamic with van art being this kind of oh will he won't he look after the team so he's both a, uh, yeah, I don't know, finger God, he's, he can use him or he can struggle with this power that might be unleashed in threatening ways. This is, I mean, this took a turn because I thought you were going to say the obvious, which is that the yellow jersey is, is the ring, um, especially given like what we know about how the person who won the race struggled with the weight of that when the race was over. But man i'm like what what about if roglic is gimli because i think they're like similar char- like characteristics and then also then he you just goes like off to do the, the side quest and then that's like roglic going to the giro to like to yeah. like you know and gimli has to protect his like his mountain or something and then that's like roglic going to the back to the giro to win the race that he was supposed to win before see the reason i thought i put through in Gollum was that he also really desperately wants this he wants Van Aert. The... He wants to be able to use Van Aert for his own, ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> his own ends. Anyway, okay. But then, what if you've got like, okay, so Stephen Krozik <laughs> is obviously Boromir because <laughs> this is the too. Guy this is going too deep now. Finish a race. <laughs> What's up, Koos? Oh, and Grisha Nimmin. Grisha Nimmin no. is Boromir, right? Cause he, uh, he's got because he, he's going to die off. <laughs> yeah, Sep- I mean, Sepkus is Samwise Nathan- Gamgee. I know. I, yeah, I was going to say, Sep is obviously Sam. He basically carries this thing in the end, uh, as he does. With, <laughs> oh, my with God, it's working better than I thought. Race. <laughs> yeah, yeah Sep, Sep Kuss is definitely Sam. And then Christoph Laporte, I think I'm, I'd actually say is Aragorn because he yes. rarely gets Ooh. the win, but but he is just like instrumental in them getting to the end. Um, and uh, yeah. What about he, Legolas, though? Got, I would think Laporte has like Legolas vibes. Tish Benut. No, I think Tish Benut would be legless. Yeah, yeah. Because he's, he's slightly he's really scrawnier, tall and gangly, mm. you know. And he's there, but he's not really the main character. But maybe he should be. Yeah. I just can't see him good. surfing like <laughs> um, Tish Benut surfing downstairs on a shield, like or shield or arrows. Okay, we need our listen. Someone who's listening to this podcast is good at either AI and feeding AI information. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, or is really good at photoshop so that's a bit of yeah. a, a bit of a dagger at johnny who is our resident photoshopper i'm not that good that's no that's i know levels but... <laughs> <of> that. 
No, Dane <laughs> Cash has his own AI Instagram yeah. account. He can definitely say, Tij Banut surfing down a set of stairs in the middle of a battle on a, on a shield as an elf. And yeah, and all the orcs are like um, Raphael Micah and George yeah. Bennett. Micah Bjerg. Yeah. We're going to take a short break. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dad. <laughs> All right, welcome back. The second half of this episode is dedicated to one of the most sort of chaotic and interesting stages of the 2022 Tour de France, which was the stage five cobblestones. And this is sort of where the tension, this internal tension at Yumbo Visma, which is, you know, clearly probably genuinely exists, but is definitely also being played up a fair amount by the way that Netflix is producing this, this thing. It's where this tension kind of comes to a head, right? So we end up with this situation where, uh, well, let's, let's talk about the bike change thing. We mentioned this earlier. What, what, I, I, I found the Netflix version to be actually more chaotic. I think I was with you, Kit, more chaotic than I even found it in, in, in real life. The reason why is the internal radios, I think, because you've got, you've got Vingago squawking, I need a bike. Jonas Vingegaard has had a bike change at a terrible moment. The bike is way too big for him. And Van Aert just leaves. And you've got whoever it was, Neiman again was in yeah. the car saying, "Who needs a bike?" Jonas has a bike off the bike off uh, off uh, somebody else. I'm on the bike of Jonas. What the fuck? Who needs a bike? Who needs a bike? He needs to go. He needs to move on. What does Vingegaard um, do? And it's all over the place. But that's really interesting because, so I think the reason why I found it more chaotic in the Netflix version is I actually think the Netflix version might be more accurate than our version. Because we were watching on television in the press room, right? We could see who needed a bike. Like, we could see who had just given a bike, who had just, who needed a bike. It was very obvious to us what the problem was. And it was also not particularly obvious to us at the time why the problem wasn't being solved. And I think that once we get that internal communication, and we haven't gotten that much of it yet in the series. In fact, I was I was hoping for a lot more of that. Once we got that, it 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 rounded out the story. It, it provided the context that I needed to understand exactly sort of what what went wrong, which was fundamentally the team not really knowing who needed a bike and when and and why and in combination with the fact that this was a, a cobble stage and so therefore the cars were not particularly close to the riders when when Finger Go first needed first had the issue. So I, I, I thought it was actually a, quite a well done sequence. I thought it was it, it, the only sequence that I like racing sequence we've seen so far where I learned something that I didn't know previously. It is pretty tough though that in Throughout this whole thing, Grisha Neiman's role is reduced to staring straight ahead, looking terrified and just screaming fuck, like over and over again. Like it's, he's probably like, well, he probably knew that was going to be a big point picked out, but he's like, well, I also do lots of other things and have great insight and leadership and ideas. I imagine we're going to see, like we said, you know, they have a role in the whole race. So we might get to see a bit more. Yeah, he'll get redemption. But this swearing, I mean, this is maybe a very minor thing. Maybe it's my BBC brain, but (laughs) there is a lot more swearing than I, but I think it's, it's because. But there's a lot less swearing than in real life. So I'm, I'm okay with it. Yeah, that's it. But I loved in the first episode when Garrett Thomas was saying, you're just going to take the fucking pin out. I just need to fucking take the pin out and just go. It was just very, in like eight words, he managed to drop in several swear words and uh but there's, there's just a lot more i, I like that and we because we, usually we get told very profusely we get we get those apologies uh, sorry if you, a belgian or a dutch writer mm. said something because it's slightly more industrial normal. language which is a terrible phrase <laughs> uh i feel like this episode like what you guys are talking about with the the cameras in the cars and getting to actually see what was going on during that bike change in the car and with the ds and everything um, 
made me think that this series isn't as tailored to non-cycling fans as we would have thought before the series came out. I feel like this episode had a lot in it for people who even watch the race and people who know a lot about cycling. Like I found that I enjoyed this. I enjoyed the first episode. I enjoyed the second episode a lot more because there was a lot more behind the scenes stuff. And so I think, I mean, I'm hopeful that going forward, there's more of this because I think there is a way for this series to be tailored to both fans and also new fans. And I think that this episode did a really good job of walking that line. I think those team car, that team car footage is so good at ramping up the, the drama and the, the stakes. And it's also like an, like you say, it's an offering to people who've already watched the race. It's a good way to do both of those things at the same time to sort of get people more engaged and like worried about how everything's going to pan out while also given people who've already watched it and know what's going to happen an extra like tidbit to to keep them to keep them going with the series i've got a question for you all who won stage five of the 2022 <laughs> tour de france because we don't apparently? get to find out no that is odd because we focus on it so much i mean the reason is that the, is that, the winner do we actually is anyone remember it was simon clark wasn't it simon yeah, clark it simon yeah clark. <laughs> okay but it's because their but, team yeah jasper stoven it does look like it yeah <laughs> it does <laughs> but it's, it's just that stupid uh, politics but i don't see why if they can include pogacar i mean maybe i do but i think we should have had at least a shot of um of uh yeah the win but then again we've got the breakaway question because this was the first breakaway stage well also it goes back to what you were saying kit with the like the pacing of it and like the highs and then back down to the lows because you had the whole Al- was it there was the whole alberto betty old drama that was yeah. in the breakaway and stuff like that which is kind of interesting but it's interesting when you get to watch it in the other way where we got to watch that in real time with that happening alongside the Wout van Aert, finger go, what's going on thing. And then the Alberto Betel bit gets resolved and you still get to see the rest of the GC story after that, I guess. Yeah, I wonder if maybe they just didn't want that part to be shown or there was too much that was... Maybe the to, you've got the Jumbo, Jumbo Visma kind of working together well story and then you've got i mean what we understand as being voters basically having giving betty a talking to for dragging pogachar towards because paulus was in the breakaway and, and mm. was seconds off getting the yellow jersey but betty was in the group behind with pogachar and pulling the gap closed um i mean Va- vanat was also chasing behind so it was it, there were lots of factors but yeah it, it I, it's again it's that kind of editing dilemma maybe yeah um well, and, and I remember when we were there and we were talking, to, I don't think we were talking to like EF team staff or anything. It may have been like the Netflix guys who were like based with EF, but I remember them talking to us and being like, oh yeah, you know, we've got some really like just good eye-opening stuff and like you'll find out things about how situations got resolved or like the inner workings of it. And like they, no doubt they like shot all that, but then I guess it just comes down to the really harsh br- brutality of or reality that there's only so much time and you can't go deep into these sort of side quests that are really interesting to us, but probably not to, well, not to French cycling fans maybe at all. And also not to some person who just switched it on on the TV. Well, and it, and it doesn't develop any of the characters any further, right? Like we, yeah. this isn't the, the, this isn't the EF episode and, and yeah, it's true. I think we'll, we'll see more of them later in, in the show, but uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't serve any, like I said in in last episode, I don't think the people making this have any real interest in telling us the story of the bike race. They have an interest in in presenting these characters and showing us their experience in this bike race, right? And so the actual the actual what happened is like a very secondary, it's tangential, tertiary. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like it's 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 almost irrelevant to to you know the way that this is put together. And and I I would imagine. You know, okay, so, so now we've had our Yumbo Visma episode, right? There's probably at least one or two more Yumbo Visma episodes later on, but we've got eight teams and eight episodes here, so we are going to see other episodes in the in the you know the next six, right? That are focused on things that have nothing to do with winning, because some of those teams that are involved in this project didn't really win anything, and I think that that they're you're, we're gonna we're gonna those are probably going to be even more frustrating in that they'll you know ignoring the guy that won the race for the purposes of character development and and sort of narrative 
is going to continue to happen. But I, I, I also, I also don't disagree with it. Like I, I yeah, f- for the purposes of, of what this is trying to do, I don't think I would have shown Simon Clark crossing the finish line either. Like, what does that do to move this this episode forward? It, it doesn't really do anything. It makes us feel good because we know Simon Clark's a super nice guy, and it was a huge moment for him. And I would have loved to have seen it on Netflix, but it doesn't really do anything for the show. Yeah, I think it's probably just important to point out though, like and highlight the other things that were going oh, for on sure. and the interesting their interesting storylines. So, yeah. What's what I'm interested about is that in at least one of the trailers, or maybe even the subtitles of either of these past two episodes there's a line from Vorta's on the bus it says never do that again and that sounds like it might be the Betty old conversation unless it's Mm. out of context and somewhere completely completely different and maybe we won't get to see the rest of that conversation or what that actually was but uh, maybe maybe they just pulled it out yeah but yeah it might may well just be a kind of oh look this is a bit of drama we'll throw this into all the dramatic bits with Mark Maddio (laughs) it it is kind of a bummer that we can't that it's not like I mean, it's not a bummer because I don't want to watch 20 episodes of this show. But in the case of Simon Clark winning this stage, which is, you know, one of the most coveted stages in the Tour de France, any stage that passes over the Roubaix cobbles is a huge deal. Um, I'm thinking like, you know, when Dagen Kolb won um, in 2017 uh, or 16, um, that was... 16 yeah that was like a huge deal that was a massive win for him and this win for Simon Clark was equally as huge considering that he almost didn't have a team in like January and was picked up last minute and obviously like I, I'm pretty sure that Israel Premier Tech isn't part of the docuseries they're not nope. and so they they wouldn't have the rights you know follow Simon Clark around but it is kind of yeah it, it's a bummer that we don't get to see more of the storylines because there's obviously we know that there's 20 other things that happened in that stage particularly that were worth writing about and i mean you can check out oh i was gonna say you can check out (laughs) our work (laughs) don't (laughs) cut that um (laughs) it's just um, a reminder of how many characters there are in the race isn't it mm. because in the same team you've got hugo hool and his story is one of the most interesting stories of the whole race that 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 stage win on what was it 16 yeah and that that it's that's been 10 years in the making and it's all emotional it's it's huge for him and it's also huge for the team um so yeah it's it's, and that like you say there are these stories throughout the peloton um simon geshka in the polka dot jersey we won't get Mm -hmm. to see any of that um so yeah it's it's just a reminder maybe that's you know that's another one of those netflix drawing people into the sport to go and discover these stories yeah may it'd be great if they could this when they film this this year's tour if they could just record all of the extra stuff and then make it like the b-sides and then maybe like we pay like five pounds or dollars or whatever and then we get to see that so then there's like two series and then once you do once you unlock once you go through the easy one then you unlock like hard mode and then you get to watch that <laughs> the dvd extra features yeah exactly yeah <laughs> Bring back DVD extra features. Oh my god! Because you know there's it. some amazing stuff, right? You know there's some yeah. absolutely amazing stuff that that is left on the cutting room floor. And well, I guess that's that's kind of what we're here to do, right? Is is to mention Simon Clark and mention Hugo Ullin and and well, and the, the, the stuff about the cobble around this. Yeah, yeah, well, the let's, cobble let's, drama. Yeah, that's a perfect example of okay. Let's 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 add a bit of context to this. So outside of what happened in in this episode on, on Netflix, Johnny, what? What did Simon Clark get for for winning this thing? It's a great little story. So traditionally, when you win the real Paris Bay, you get a little trophy and you get a cobble with a cobble on it from the supposed. Well, it's it's not going to be one from the road, but it's like the same the same type or brand or whatever of cobble. But then the rumor then started spreading that someone had gone out onto the the cobbles during or well, after the Tour de France stage to dig out a cobble, which is a big big no no, and then had presented it to simon clark as like his like trophy because he wouldn't get a real trophy he just you know gets whatever you get the little lion the a lion or whatever no you didn't get that's yellow jersey whatever the medal for winning this tour stage but then we found out that the cobble didn't come from the road it just came from someone who had given the cobble to him who has and where they are in belgium a collection of cobbles i think is this am i getting this right kelly he had his own he had his own like cobbles that were the same yeah, so this guy managed to source a bunch of cobbles that were from the same quarry yeah. as the ones that 
are on most of like like the Arenberg, for example, yeah. which is you know one of the major sectors in Perry Bay. He has a bunch of these cobbles that came from the same quarry, so the same type of rock. They're the same sort of like rounded yeah. feel. If you're curious what the Roubaix cobble looks like when you win a Roubaix cobble, check out Allison Jackson on Instagram or uh, TikTok. She has some really awesome videos with her cobble that she won this year. <laughs> Super sweet. So we had some some good cliches this episode uh, and and some excellent swearing, as we mentioned previously. Best cliche? You can't win the race on the cobbles, but you can lose it. I never knew that. <laughs> Gets trotted out oh about ten million times. Oh, yeah. uh, every time there's a there's a cobble stage of the Tour de France, but you gotta say it out loud. Right? Well, they managed to gotta... slip it in twice in about four minutes at the beginning of the episode, which, which is, is excessive. Interesting. Yeah. Excessive, I think. Well, so to, to wrap to, to wrap up today, where where do we feel like the narrative ends up at the end of this thing in terms of Yumbo Visma? Because they were the focus of the episode. We had this sort of early tension that was built by two very strong riders in the same team having kind of divergent needs and goals. Those needs and goals ended up actually coalescing at the end of the episode, right? Where do we feel like we stand here going forward? But it's not wholly solid ground, is it? But it is much more solid than it was at the beginning of the episode. So there's a good foundation for the re- remainder of the race. And we got Primoz, who was definitely chucked in there because he's going to do something later. Yeah. I also just one mo- note on Primoz Roglic's ride in, on those cobbles. We didn't know when we were watching a live that his shoulder would come out of the socket. So then when watching that back now, Every time he was going over cobbles and they showed his shoulders jiggling around, I was just like, oh my God, that must be so painful, the poor guy. In, in the post-stage interview, you saw like the old school Roglic who wouldn't really answer questions with that much length. And it was like, oh, so, so you dislocated your shoulder? And he was like, yeah. And it's like, oh, and you popped it back in yourself? He's like, well, yeah. Like that's what, that's what you used to get out of Roglic before it, like, he, found, he found his range. So we get a little taste of of what the next episode is going to look like. Uh, the, the the episode title is "Weight of a Nation," uh, and I guess think you can probably guess what nation we're talking about. This is this is the French people, and we're going to be looking at French riders, I'm sure. Johnny, we got a bit of taste of this with with Mark Matteo. So first, uh, who is Mark Matteo, and what do we see? He's the eccentric team boss of is eccentric even the right word he's just like loud and crazy and he's a team boss of one of the biggest french passionate. teams group armor fdj yes very passionate and he's about as french and french team boss as you can get and there's a great clip of when the race arrives back in france uh from denmark and the interview asks him like oh, is it is it is it good to to be back in france and he like sort of takes a deep breath in it's like oh, it's always it's always great to be back in france as if like he's been holding his breath the whole time he's been out of his own country and now he's like finally i can i can relax and everything's good again i'd like he's to look extremely up extremely french i'd like to look up whether a french team or specifically group home fdj have ever won a stage or how many stages they've won on at foreign grand departs because I imagine Mark Meadows just betting. going around just being like, this is not right. Where are we? What's going on? <laughs> well, next episode, like I said, we're gonna, it's, it's clearly going to be focusing on the French. Uh, and we will, well, we'll dive into it deeply. I think that's it from us today. Reminder, you can get all these episodes on the regular Escape Collective channel. You can also get them faster on the unchained binge pod channel if you would like to get them as soon as we make them and further reminder head over to escapecollective.com slash join that's uh that's how we fund this whole thing this uh, this whole operation this podcast the website everything it's all membership funded if you're not a member please consider joining up we have monthly billing options now which is great uh, and you'll get full access to not just obviously these podcasts, which are free, but all of our all of our content up on the website, which is going to be kind of important as we go into the Tour de France here. We're going to have lots of really, really, really good stuff you're going to want to read all through July. So make sure you head over to escapecollective.com slash join. All right. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Thanks, Kit. 
Thanks. Sorry for derailing the podcast. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. Thanks. We'll be back with another episode of the Unchained Binge Podcast as soon as we can make it. See y'all. <laughs>